there's a good deal of euphemism in this business and reprofiling is one of them. The genus is restructuring. Okay. One species is reprofiling. This conversation in, in large part is likely to look like a sovereign debt restructuring 101. You know, what does it mean? You know, what do we do? Right. Uh, at the outset, let me sort of, I mean, we've been interchangeably using at least in Sri Lanka have been using several terms in discussing sovereign debt restructuring. And those terms are, I mean, as the title of this presentation or webinar suggests, uh, restructure is one word we use in terms of sovereign debt. We have come across this term reprofile the debt. We have also heard about haircuts and then clipping coupons and clipping the principal payments. So several terms here, restructure, reprofile, uh, clipping coupons and clipping the principal and also haircuts. Are these interchangeable terms in the sovereign debt restructuring business? There's, by the way, there's a good deal of euphemism in this business and reprofiling is one of them. The genus is restructuring. Okay. One species is reprofiling. Reprofiling connotes a transaction in which maturities are extended but there is no principal haircut and typically not even an adjustment to coupon the term was first used in 2003 by uruguay uruguay had 18 bonds in the international capital markets at that point uh, they did not want to restructure them in a savage way because they felt that uh, they simply needed a breathing space uh, uh, in order to recover uh, their financial footing. And so what they said to the creditors was, let's move the maturity date of each of those 18 bonds out by five years, but we'll leave the interest rates, the coupon rates where they are, and we won't haircut them. Uh, and it worked. It works. Uh, Uruguay has never again had to restructure its debt. The term uh, took on a greater significance a few years ago uh, when the IMF changed its policies. Uh, the traditional policy of the IMF was binary. If the IMF concluded that you had an unsustainable debt stock, uh, uh, and you had lost market access, uh, the IMF would open a program for you on the assumption that you were going to restructure that debt stock. By restructure it, I mean do something like a principal haircut or a coupon modification. <clears throat> or if the IMF concluded that your debt was sustainable, they would not ask you uh, to do that. But <laughs> There were a large number of countries that fell in between those two bright line. Uh, and the question was well, what to do with those countries. You see, if the fund did not require the country to restructure its debt, then money lent by the IMF and the other official sector actors to the country might just bleed out to pay commercial creditors in full and on time. Uh, and if it turned out that the country's debt was unsustainable, those creditors will have escaped and been replaced by official sector, aka taxpayer funded uh, lenders. So the change in policy was to have a third category uh, applicable to countries as to which the fund staff could neither assert with confidence that the debt was sustainable, nor could they say it's unsustainable, and that was to reprofile the debt. It meant that you move the maturity date of the commercial debt outside of the window in, of the IMF program into which the IMF is lending. 
that solved the problem of having the money simply bleed out to pay commercial creditors in full. And in effect, it's a holding pattern and, and you wait to see uh, whether circumstances will render the debt stock sustainable or perhaps unsustainable. Uh, and if the latter, the commercial creditors are still exposed to the country because they have been reprofiled, pushed out. A restructuring means also that creditors get new bonds, do they, uh, that specify new terms? Yeah, typically in a commercial restructuring, yes, it's called an exchange offer. Um, you typically do not try to amend your bond within its four corners. Uh, you would issue a new instrument to replace it. Uh, now, what Belize is doing right now is very unusual. It's doing a cash buyback of its bond for 51.7 cents on the dollar. Uh, but that is being funded by a nature conservancy organization uh, who's prepared to lend Belize that money. But that, that's very rare. A uh, garden variety transaction would be a bond exchange. Uh, and collective action clauses that are found uh, in sovereign bond agreements are something that we would certainly like to discuss. And I suppose the formation of committees are governed by uh, covenants in the bond agreements? Occasionally, but frankly, in a minority of cases. Sure. Uh, 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 collective action clauses are provisions in bonds that say that if a supermajority, typically 75% of the holders of that bond by value, agree to the terms of a restructuring, that decision binds any dissenting minority. Uh, this is how corporate insolvency statutes work, like chapter 11 in this country, uh, you get uh, a supermajority and very often two thirds of the creditors to agree and they bind uh, the entire class of creditors. Those clauses <clears throat> uh, had been used in English law bonds since the late 19th century, but not in New York law bonds. Uh, when Argentina defaulted on its debt in 2000, the very end of 2001, uh, it had north of $80 billion of bond indebtedness and that those bonds did not contain these clauses. Uh, what it meant was there was no institutionalized or contractual method for forcing individual bondholders to go along with the deal stated differently, there was a risk that so-called holdout creditors, creditors who for whatever reason said, I'm not going to accept the deal, uh, could decline it and pursue their legal remedies. Uh, and that's of course exactly what happened against Argentina for the next 15 years. The response to that was to promote the use of collective action clauses in New York law and English law, emerging market sovereign bonds, and they have now become nearly ubiquitous. Uh, and they have improved over time. The latest iteration was in 2015, uh, when uh, a new version of a collective action clause was promulgated uh, by the International Capital Markets Association and has now significantly caught on. Talk to us about the jurisdictions uh, under which these international sovereign bonds are typically issued. You, you referred to New York law and English law. Um, uh, can you tell us the history of this? How, how, does, how, how do bonds get issued in these jurisdictions? Yeah. The, English law and New York law, two common law jurisdictions, probably account for 90% of the international, what you call international sovereign bonds that are issued by emerging market sovereigns. Uh, the reason is that the investor community is familiar with the law in those jurisdictions. 
the law has evolved over time to try to strike a balance of neutrality between the interests of debtors and creditors. Both jurisdictions covet their reputation as being uh, a neutral fora uh, in which the judiciary will not be giving an advantage, say, to the uh, home team creditor. Uh, and, and so simply it makes the sale of the bonds in their initial offering uh, that much easier. And because they're common law jurisdictions, there is an enormous precedent for how disputes are resolved and legal advisors can tell their clients, both on the debtor side and the creditor side, with a great deal of confidence, that this is how this provision in the contract would be interpreted, for example. Uh, something that other legal regimes might not be able to do because it's it's left up to the individual judge. So probably 90% of them uh, of international sovereign bonds for emerging market countries are issued under and choose the law of New York or, or England for this purpose. Thank you.